So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. I'm just sharing this YouTube link into Facebook because unfortunately, Facebook won't allow us to go live. We um, have some technical issues. We tried from several computers and apparently they are going through maintenance or something. And we weren't able to broadcast on Facebook, but I shared the link. So whoever is joining on YouTube now, um, I welcome you. My name is Van Hitapia. I'm an actor slash producer, and I'm the founder of Actor Slash. And I'm very excited to be here today with these amazing guests who are connecting from different parts of the world and who are experts in the theme that we have today, theater. What is the future of the live performances? So I would like to start talking and welcoming my first guest. He's a Broadway personality. And um, I think I'm gonna change the speaker a little bit so you guys can see me a little better and, um, and bring my next guest with me. Um, so just, just listen to, to, to this, this amazing, amazing, um, biography that this guy has so and you probably know him already i'm very sure that a lot of you guys are here because of him so um, he has had a long career that converts multiple mediums tv film and theater he has winning many la directing awards including one from the broadwayworld.com he has been nominated for two WGA awards for best comedy, um, comedy episodic writing for his work on the classic TV series, The Golden Girls in Rosen. His name is Stan Zimmerman, who, has also, who also wrote and produced on Gilmore Girls and co-created the Lifetime sitcom Rita. I hope everybody can see me. Um, Rita rocks he has directed and um write and ep creator on the emmy nominated websites sex and excess on telefilms and he uh where am i in film he wrote both brighty bunch movies zimmerman has been busy lately writing directing and co-producing theater some of his critical, uh, critically acclaimed productions include Heartbreak Help, Pledge Warm Cheese, Daughter of Entertainment, Mr. Sloan, Blink and You Might uh, Miss Me, Spike Heels, A Tuna Christmas, and Gemini. He also directed three of the plays he wrote with Christian McCollum. Yes, Virginia, Knife to the Heart, and Meet and Greet. Stan was on Broadway with, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, Stan, when you come back, uh, when you show up, uh, Noreyev and the Joffrey Ballet at Mark um, Hellinger Theater. He was the host and showrunner on Sean Hayes' Bravo reality show, Situation Comedy. Stan also teaches audition technique classes in LA and New York City. He has a BFA drama, New York, um, NYU slash Circle in the Square. Stan Suicide Notes play, uh, right before I go, has been performed at New York City's Town Hall and in uh, Bethesda, Orlando and Claremont, California. Stan directed the much talked about Latinx production of the Diary of Anne Frank. The Diary of Anne Frank, which has had runs in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and Vancouver. Please welcome Stan Zimmerman. I'm exhausted. Jeez. <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. I'm exhausted. No, that long list. I've had people say, but I love cut, your... down, cut down your resume. It's too much. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Stan, you have done so many things. I, and DJing, you didn't say DJing. I like to, I love music. So when you come to my plays, I always play really good pre-show music and then post-show music and in between scenes. And I love, I'm just obsessed with music. I mean, I remember the day, you're probably too young, 
virgin music in um, in Hollywood. I would just go and just try music and collect, you know, back when we listened to CDs. I've never been to that one where they did the one in in in, um, in Paris in the Champs Elysees, and it was like a three story. Yes. It was pretty, I'm very sure it's the same idea. Yeah, I, I remember someone said, if this is your first time, meet me on the second floor. And people will know it. It's at Sunset it's, and Laurel. And they I brought me on the second floor. And then you look down and it was just a sea of music and music I didn't know. So I would just always try stuff out. And I learned so many new artists and, and became quite obsessed. Next time I'm going to use some of your music. <laughs> for the opening. I was I was grooving to your, your intro music. I like it. You know, it's a DJ who did it. I DJ know. Did I mean, it. We're going to start doing a strip tease, but I figured your audience wouldn't like that. So. Yeah, and I'm I'm so sorry. I we, we, We're supposed to be doing this on Facebook and never connected, and we tried from different computers, but oh, we left a message, so yeah. hopefully all our friends are connecting and, and doing it from there. Um. So anyway, Stan, I'm very excited that you're here because we have never met in person. We're no, just we're like good. Instagram friends, right? Yeah. So we just stalk each other silently through Instagram. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But I just follow your work and it's amazing. When I told the others that you were going to be here, I remember Sandy's like, oh my God, I know him. I've been in his place and all that. You'll hear everything. So stay with me and join me too. Um, welcome Sandy and let's read a little bit of Sandy because she's also an amazing she's a truly actor slasher for those who don't know what actor slash means it's actors creating opportunities and they're actors slash producer slash directors not that we want to do everything but sometimes we don't book the job sometimes, we have to, these days you have to do it all and, I mean sometimes I don't got... get enough auditions I need to create my own opportunities and yeah. produce and get working on this. And she's a truly slasher. Sandy Duarte, a Dora Award winner, has almost recently been hailed as Los Angeles Time Critics' Choice and Best Theater Top 10 of 2019 by Charles McNulty for her ensemble work in Fefu and her friends, or Fefu, uh, by Maria Irene Forrest as the long standing iconic Odyssey Theater in West LA. She won the prestigious Dora Award for her outstanding female performance for the production of Blood, written by Tom Wamsley, her very first ever Dora nomination and win for a role the playwright himself, Tom, has specifically asked for as her to perform. Blood also garnered three nominations for a production Duarte not only starred in, but also had produced. Totally a slasher. Sandy also performed in Wamsley's uh, classic, Something Red, in the world premiere theatrical debut of uh, Wamsley's The Nun's Vacation, which she had also produced and garnered rave reviews in addition to Now Magazine's esteemed critics pick. Completing a two month run on stage at the Odysseus Theater, Sandy was thrilled to be a part of the critical acclaimed cast team of Fefu and her friends, where she portrayed the haunted Julia in a wheelchair following a mysterious hunting accident. Fefu and her friends ran August 3rd through September 29th in 2019 in Los Angeles. Odyssey Theater Ensemble continues it's Circa 69. I think you guys say Circa, but I, I went Italian. Circa 69, season of significant and adventurous plays that premiered around the time of the Odyssey's 1969 inception with the signature work of this early feminist giant of the avant-garde, Maria Irene Forne. Sandy Duarte's desire to expand has driven her to go global where she can work and live in Europe, Canada, and the US. She works and resides between Los Angeles, California, and Toronto, Canada, and looks forward to continually expanding her heart and mind in all areas from stage to cinema. Welcome, please, everybody, Sandy Hi. Duarte. Hey. Sandy. Then, hey, now I feel like I really have to edit that bio. <laughs> I went like, 
shirt bio, but you know what? It's pretty good. It fit in the Instagram messages. <laughs> Thank you. Sandy, you're amazing. And I'm very honored to have you among these monsters that are amazingly um, well what, a, what an honor to be with them. Don't, wouldn't you think that? You and I as an actress, it's like, <gasps> and wait to see the list. Now we're going to go with another amazing, amazing personality in theater. He has given so much to theater in Los Angeles. And his name is Jose Luis Valenzuela. I went to many of his plays and his production. He's amazing. He is the artistic director of the Latino Theater Company, the LATC, and the Los Angeles Theater Center, the LATC. And he is also a distinguished professor and served as head of the MFA directing program at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Valenzuela is an award-winning theater director and has been a visionary and an advocate for Chicano in Latinx, okay, so now the new trend is Chicanx in Latinx theater for over 30 years. He has directed critically acclaimed productions as major, uh, major theaters, both internationally and nationally, including the LATC, where he created the Latino Theater Lab in, in 1985, and the Marta, Perf, the, uh, Marta Perf Forum, where he established the Latino Theater Initiative in 1991. He has produced two of the country's largest national and international Latinx, Latinx theater festivals, Encuentro in 2014 and Encuentro de las Americas 2017, which I went and it was amazing. Most recently, he directed Karen, Zac Karen Zacarias' Destiny of Desire at the South Coast Repertory the Goodman Theater, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Milwaukee Repertory, uh, uh, the, Good, uh, the Godry, and Cincinnati Playhouse. Please welcome Jose Luis Valenzuela. <laughs> now I have more people to clap for Jose Luis. Jose Luis, are you there? He's coming, he's coming soon. Okay, there he is. We can't hear you. So you have to unmute your phone, your, there Here you are. I am. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, it's great to see, to be with all of you. I think I saw Fefu, I talked to Stan, uh, we talked on the phone mostly, I don't think we saw. We, we did meet, I did come down there. But yes, 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 yeah. So thank I, I, you. Man. I hounded you, you couldn't meet me. I was like, I don't care what you say, <laughs> I'm gonna be there, I wanna meet you, I've heard all about you, I wanna <laughs> come and, Pay my respect and <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Banke, for having us here in this conversation. We all shall because wow, Jose Luis, man, all the things you have done in Los Angeles, you kind of revolutionary the, the way we see theater and expanded the possibilities. And someone who also has been doing this like globally as well. And that's why I wanted you guys to meet one another because you should be collaborating together. He is logging in from, I left him to the end, I told him he's the, the sherry of the cake. Mm -hmm. um, he is being, um, well, he's new, new to Los Angeles, Hollywood, like three, four years only, but his festival is not. He is logging in from Sydney, Australia, from the future, by the way, because right now it's Saturday, the 15th there in Sydney. It's 10.46 there a.m. And his name is Mark Cleary. Mark Cleary is an Australian writer, director, and producer, another slasher. He's best known for establishing Sure and Sweet, the largest 10-minute minute theater and film festivals in the world with annual events in 14 countries, including Australia, U.S., Japan, Philippines, United Kingdom, Ireland, United, uh, United Arab Emirates, Malaysia, and New Zealand. He is co-founder of the Sydney Fringe Festival and numerous shows and events. Decades ago, I bet you guys didn't know this, Mark had a series of successful careers as a journalist, editor, and publisher of newspapers and magazines, and then as a creative director, 
and then partner of a thriving advertising agency in Sydney, Australia. I didn't know this. He gave all that away, all his fame and all his money and all those successful things that anyone would have loved just to follow his heart into the theater. That wasn't on his bio, I said it. He's been looking for it ever since and the search continues to this day. Welcome, Mark Cleary from Australia. <laughs> Very international. How well, thank you, you for, that, for that warm welcome. I, I don't think that I've ever uh, put a cherry on the top before, so. You've <laughs> never been a cherry in the top. No, I, I don't think that that's my natural role. <laughs> but well, next time we'll put you like as the cream of the, the top. Um, okay, it looks like we need more volume. Let's see. So anyway, hmm. so here we are. Let me bring this close to me, hopefully like this. My amazing husband, Justin Regis, who was trying to save the situation just a moment ago, is listening to, from somewhere else. But apparently we don't have enough volume. Okay, so guys, thank you so much really for joining. I'm just beyond excited to have you all here because you are just amazing. You, I, I admire you, I follow you, and I try to learn as much as I can from you. And, and I'm very excited to have you and that now you are meeting virtually in person somehow. Uh, so I wanna ask you before we, we talk about um, what's happening in the world, where were you in your career, in your performances or on your productions where the COVID-19 showed up in your lives? What was interrupted? Were you about to do something to embark yourself in a project? Were you just in the middle of something? Tell, uh, let's start with you, Stan. Uh, I was actually in New York in the very thick of it in the middle of March, March 12th. I was doing a reading of a new play. We were doing a workshop that I wrote for an actor named Nathan Lee Graham. And we were in rehearsals for four days and then Broadway shut down. And we decided, yeah, I remember I was dr having drinks with somebody at Sardi's, which looks over, um, you know, uh, Schubert Alley. And my friend who works at a, a theater company came in just like that. I'm like, what? And she said there was an usher at the Booth Theater where Lord Metcalf was doing uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in previews. And an usher had tested positive. And we both knew at that moment the world was changing, something's gonna happen, it was so serious. So we were gonna have two workshop readings and we decided because the rehearsal space was small and could fit under 40 people, that that was still at that time okay to do. And we thought it might be good for people to come together, have a drink and just talk about what was going on and have a laugh about the play. So we did the play. I was set to stay in New York for two more weeks and I'm a, a true slasher and I started out as an actor at age seven and now I've come back to acting and I'm acting in my uh, Suicide Notes play, which you had mentioned, uh, which is like vagina monologues only using real suicide notes. Um, <laughs> and uh, like Kurt Cobain and War Veterans and uh, we were gonna be doing it and now I'm in the play. I got talked into becoming the narrator character, putting that in the play, it's me basically. Uh, by Michael Wilson, the director. He's a big Broadway director. And um, we were gonna do it at Fairfield University at the end of March. And of course, all schools shut down and uh, it took me an hour to get a plane reservation to come back to LA and here I am. So you are normally based in both cities? Um, I'm based in LA, I went to NYU. I came here to make it in TV. And now I just want to go back and do theater in, in New York. And all my stuff has been wanting to move back that way. Um, and then now with theater not happening. And um, so we were set to do um, the Suicide Notes play in Connecticut and then a big benefit in Detroit, which is where I'm from. We were gonna revive uh, my Latinx diary Van Frank at the Colony Theater in Burbank. 
for three shows and two of them all for kids. And, and uh, we we're very excited about that. And I was going to be doing also directing in April a production of Wendy Wasserstein, Isn't It Romantic? And all of those postponed until next year. Wow. Yeah. Um, I'm so sorry to hear it for that. Um, but well, I know you've been keeping busy, so yes. we'll talk about that in a moment. How about you, Sandy? <laughs> Where are you? Because I know you were here. No, and then you went to visit your family or you went to Toronto. You're you're logging in from Canada right now. Yes. And and then you just couldn't come back. <laughs> well, this this is what happened, Van Hey. And first of all, such an honor to be on the panel with all you guys, truly. Um, you know, I, I had such an inspiring 2019, and I thought I'm gonna go home for Christmas for December. I soaked it up and, and I got back in January to LA, you know, ready to, to start the new year as we always do with positivity and, and all that. And then COVID hit. And um, I tried to stay on as long as possible uh, in LA, but I had family and friends constantly calling, you know, uh, uh, you, you got to come home. Things, you, know, you just don't know the seriousness of something until you daily, people are just, please come home. So anyway, I decided that it was best to just return back to Canada, which is my home homeland, even though LA is my spirit home. And, uh, and I, I've been here ever since just writing it out in, uh, in the good old North, <laughs> waiting to see um, when I can come back, but I'm, I'm actually coming back um, at the end of the month. So it's, it's, it's interesting, but I've been patiently, safely here in Canada and and, and that's that, you sort of uh, surrender to, to whatever it is and, and keep going somehow. So now I'm here and, and that, that's my story. Do you can come back into the United States? What are the rules on that? Um, I, I think, you know, Canada has been really strict. Um, I don't know if LA requires the whole 14 day quarantine the way we are, but I'm kind of, I'm prepared for that. So I'm, I'm gonna, I'm really curious to see what it's like returning back and seeing how it is from, from that side. Um, I, I don't know, I'll, I'm ready to quarantine again, I guess. Canada is doing amazing. My niece, she's, she's flying to Vancouver as we speak. She's going yeah. to college there. She's supposed to go in March and they canceled everything, but they move it for now. And they said that they're probably Canada's going to close the, the borders again. Yeah. Uh, more, more strict. So they said, you better come before. But um, she's, she doesn't start until September. Yeah. But this is what they said. You have to show up at least two weeks or 20 days before. And you have to put yourself on quarantine. So she's yeah. flying right now to Canada as we speak with her dog, with all the <laughs> paperwork and everything. They canceled her direct flight from Mexico City to Canada, to Vancouver. So she's doing it through San Francisco. Ah. And she's really requiring. So she had to give the address or where she's going to be quarantining. And she's like, how am I going to feed myself? So she's going to have to do Uber, e Uber Eats or something. And she already got a whole attic or, or a basement or something that she rented before she can go to the college. But it's amazing. I, I mean, we should, all countries should be doing something like that. But I'm very, I was very pleased to hear that they really are taking it seriously and they're taking yeah. measurements. And we re we really are. And so uh, it, it's we're working together. And I, I think it's a good example. And I'm I'm telling people that I'm on my you know return that trust me, I'm COVID free. I'm I'm very careful. <laughs> I'm coming from Canada, so hopefully it's not too much trouble. You know. Um, but you know, we just, we just gotta just work together and hopefully, you know, learn from each other country to country. And just on the plane, at the airport, mask Masking. Up, <laughs> and the, the face, you know, everything. Spray. <laughs> yeah, everything. How about you, Jose Luis? You, you had a lot on your plate. I remember, so because I do follow the LATC and everything, and you were ready to... You had so many projects, didn't you? Yes, yes, yes. We were in the middle of. We were. I was in the middle of. I Meaning we were in the middle of opening the season this year, which is like five, uh, ten plays or eleven plays actually, um, and we were going to open like very quickly, like March twenty sixth, I believe. I know I was rehearsing uh, La Victima about the migration, and I I was just finished casting another play, just like us. 
from Karen Zacharias, who was going to start rehearsals on Monday. And this is like the 14th of March. Uh, we were, uh, she and other African American play, we had like five plays that we were casting and, re and they were beginning to rehearse that I was not directing, but they were all going to be produced at the time. Uh, and uh, and then because we have two seasons, we have the fall season and the and the and the, and the spring season. Uh, and then on the 14th, we shut down the theater. Uh, we we just uh, sent everybody home. Uh, everybody's working from home, which is kind of great. All my staff. We don't have a big staff, but you know everybody who was full time, we were able to keep on salary to this time and for them to be working uh, from home. But we haven't gone to the theater, and I haven't. I've been in my house for five months. I think I gone out five times. So I'm not carrying my beer until I go out. This is, <laughs> this is my COVID beer. And uh, but you know, I only be going out because I had to go te be tested and I, my passport and things like that. But uh, it's 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 been a, a tremendous uh, change. Uh, incredible, I meaning incredible about uh, where we are and what is gonna happen, you know, I mean, we, Monday or uh, we did all our programming digital now. So we just in that big, big moment where everything has been gonna go digital beginning uh, thing or first thing is gonna be on Wednesday. And then from then on all the way to December, there is gonna be digital programming Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, every day until like December 12th. We are doing, I believe, we are doing archival stuff that is like 12 uh, plays. And, and then we're doing five of the productions. We're gonna do some readings. And then we have a playwright festival, which is eight new plays that begins in October and then or have our, our holiday season play, uh, which is gonna air December 12th. And so if, if, if you wanna talk to me, Banke, about OBS and all these things, because I, you know, we, we have to train the entire, my entire staff into this digital stuff. So it's been a lot of training in the last month about how to do digital stuff. So, you know, if you if you want to talk to me, I can. Yeah, can please connect me. I'm learning the OBS, so I can do it uh, um, do it on both ways, uh, Facebook and in in YouTube and mm -hmm. spray and do all those cool things. <laughs> because I was just telling uh, Stan came late, but. Uh, I joined the Baja California International Film Festival to run the whole festival online <laughs> within two weeks. And it was all June, all the month of June. And it was awesome. But yes, definitely we need to, to um, I think it's a great option to go digital in a lot of things. Um, but I'm curious, I'm gonna go back to you, Jose Luis, to know uh, what kind of problems you're gonna have. Yeah. Mark, you have it hard because it's 14 festivals. I mean, 14 countries that you normally run your festival and it's once a year in different countries. Yeah, so many different cities. No, is it 14 cities or how is it? It's, it's about 40 cities. And it's 40, 40 cities. 40. And, wow. Exactly. And for, yeah. So I was in Dubai when it all when things started to get very paranoid, and um, we managed to get um, the whole eight week festival done there. And I flew back to Sydney, where the festival in Sydney was running, and I think we made it another two weeks before people were just too paranoid to continue. Really, uh, and audiences were frightened, the actors were frightened, and so we pulled the plug five weeks into a ten week festival. Uh, and we've been, Sydney, as you probably know, and Australia has done pretty well, mm. I think, like Canada. Um, and aside from an outbreak that we've got in Melbourne at the moment, um, the rest of the country is mostly COVID-free. And Sydney is getting 10 to 12, 15 new cases a day. But mostly because of the contact tracing, they can find um, where they come from. So we feel pretty safe. Um, but really the heart of what we do is about live audiences coming together. 
and the option to take it online. I mean, really what happens there is that we sustain our activity by selling tickets, you know, and to, to get the resources to put on shows. If you're funded by the government, let's say that Los Angeles County is, you know, giving you a million dollars a year, you can afford to do that. But otherwise it's a real challenge. Um, and short and sweet, the many festivals that we do, most of them are not produced by us in Sydney. They're produced by local people who have to find the resources and the money to um, put their programs on, hire a theater and pay their staff, et cetera, in each different location. So it's a big challenge to do that. Um, and really we're yeah, facing yeah. an existential threat. Mm -hmm. This is a threat to theater that may have ripples that run out for the next decade. Like when will our audiences be happy to come and sit next to each other in a theater again? I mean, Jose Luis, you, I mean, that's the, the puzzle for you. I mean, I, after leaving advertising 20 years ago and foolishly going full time into the theater, um, <laughs> the challenge has always been survival. Like, how do you survive? How do you get enough money to buy the things you need to do and put on the shows that you're trying to put on? And it's such a struggle. And when the audiences are the ones who are frightened and fearful to sit next to each other, it's a, it's a massive change. Um, I'm hopeful that we will get over it completely and that there will be a, the right sort of treatments and the right sort of vaccines and, and we'll all be you know, back to normal at some point. In, in Australia, because your numbers are low, has there been any talk in the theater community be, about when you would start up again? Like we were planning, start... we were planning middle of August to come back and finish our festival to do another five weeks. And then we just started getting a little bit fearful. So we pushed it to September. And just the last few days, I've been telling people, well, let's look at October now. So, but, but you can't sort of do a restart and then stop because that, that if anything, people get even more disenchanted with it. And the number of participants in Short and Sweet is a, you, you may not know the program, but basically what we do is we put on 10 minute theater each night that you would see Short and Sweet. Maybe you will see 10 plays. Each play has got a different director and a different cast. Lange knows this well because she's been in it as an actor, haven't you, Lange? You've been on stage for Short and Sweet. Yeah, that was my very first one. Um, yeah. The very, the very first edition uh, of Short and Sweet, uh, the Latino. Oh, oh, the although first. my play was in English, but you weren't there yet. You, you, you came a little like two weeks later. You couldn't yeah. see it because it was like a whole month. Of the yeah. Festival. yeah, but that was my very first performance uh, with Short and Sweet. Yeah. The other ones I came back as a producer. So many people involved. So it means. So many. Man, managing backstage is a is yeah. a nightmare. It's not like we're doing a two-hander. There might be thirty or forty actors backstage, yeah. so the the technical you know, saving everyone's health is even more um, concentrated than it is in most situations. But so we're 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 waiting, hopefully, um, for the circumstances to change. And have you thought about doing it outside? Yes, we we have, but. It's just, it's such a, um, a lot of the people that take, take part are not fully professional. They, they might be, we're, we're seldom amateurs, but uh, independent theater makers, some professionals, really it's very hard to do uh, theater of that nature um, without lights, without um, being able to control the environment without a proper backstage. I mean, yes, we could do a special event outside, but can we do it week after week, doing ten plays at ten plays a week? We've, we've I think the the current numbers that Short and Sweet is up to is ten thousand new works on stage wow. over the last twenty years. Wow! Wow! You know so, that your theater it's it's plays. Well, it's mostly plays, but it's also Musical theater, dance. And dance. So that's challenging because I was going to say, and, and uh, what I was doing with the Baja California International Film Festival is film festival. So people can see it online. Indeed. But challenge of theater, which is pretty much the base and the root of the acting, that's live. Mm -hmm. And have you guys think of, do you have any suggestion on how can it be done? I mean, 
like digit digitally do you think we can perform theater digitally okay we can but we do it with such limitations on what yeah. it normally is because it's a live event i mean it's actors and an audience actors I mean, have to be together somehow it's yeah. the most yeah. un unique part of the theater when you're actually with an and an, you know the if you sweat on stage, the audience can feel it sometimes. Yeah. I was just in rehearsal today for a reading I'm doing on Wednesday with George Takei and Daniel Davis. Um, and we spent so much time just figuring out the boxes and who's coming where and where it's gonna be, all this. It was like tech and rehearsal. In a way, I almost, I told my director, Michael Yuri uh, from Ugly Betty, the actor, that it's almost like the golden age of television, their first time they did plays on a soundstage and figuring out live cameras and how do you do that? We're kind of in just a smaller it's, box. It's but. a big distraction in lots of ways. And I'm, I'm fascinated, Longay, that you've taken it on with such uh, enthusiasm and I'm glad that you have. But, but um, you know, doing film is a different thing, of course. Right, we can, right maintain our film festivals but for us the trick for our film program is that we have we're able to do it in hollywood and we always do it where we're segued with the theater program right. uh, so in, in with our partner um lee strasberg in in la i mean we have their fantastic space to work in and we just roll different festival programs out so seamlessly and because of that the there's an economy of scale now, here's, a, here's something you may not know. Nick Hardcastle, our festival director there, who is fantastic, he's on a flight back to Australia next week, I think. And the fact that Nick's actually left, I mean, our government makes you go into hotel quarantine and the Australian government pays for it, but that's ended now, except for people who booked. I'll go, I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you would be welcome normally. I am happy to, to host you normally, but um, of course we can't let you in right. because you're carrying <laughs> germs. But it's true. A lot of people are flying back home. We had a roommate, uh, a great, great actor, Mario Corona, who has performed on Sharon Sweet, of course. And, uh, and, and he was just here and he went to, to Christmas to Mexico City. And then he just couldn't come back. And all his things are here. They're just here. And uh, of course, his immigration documentation expired. He was applying from his working visa to um, to the green card residency. And now he's in between both, mm -hmm. but he hasn't been able to come. And now he doesn't have a room or anything. I mean, we, we kept all his things and his car is here, but he's not the only one. I know so many friends who went back to Canada, went back to Europe, went back home. I'm married to an American, so, so Los Angeles is my home. Mm. And for the first time, I traveled Monday to Tijuana, I came back yesterday, and I feel very safe there. And but you drove, though, Vanga, you drove across to I San drove, Diego. but it's not the same, right? It's not the same as no. copying on the plane for going to Australia. Nick, that's, what is it, 16 hours one way, 18 hours the other? It's going to be a long, it, it, there's really not much... There's a lot of not many things to do um, unless you have voiceover talent. I record in my closet a lot. <laughs> in my <laughs> closet studio. I call it the closed studio. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, wow, that's amazing. Jose Luis, going back to what you're doing, so you're going to be doing all these programs digitally, but what kind of programs, if, may, if I can ask? Uh, well, it, it, it's been very complicated because of the unions. Uh, uh, it's, that's taking a long time to figure out how to work with the with the unions, and because we're an equity house, uh, it's impossible to do an equity show right now and do it for one showing on digital. So uh, we're able to make it through SAG and after act type of contracts, which is much much better for the actors. Uh, but it is it is. Uh, was it's, it, it's we have different directors for different plays they were all cast so in a way what each director is taking a different approach to what they're the way they're doing it we as a as a company we just need to provide the technical support 
by this mean if you were an actor in the play, for example, we're sending you the green screen, the two lights, if you need the computer, the special microphone. Uh, meaning we're trying to give you whatever technically you will need that that specific director wants in order to create the type of world that they want to do. You have to be in your house. I mean, there's no way we can, you know, I mean, we have a big space or theater is 84,000 square feet, but even just to try to open that theater when we open, it's gonna cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. because we have to prepare it uh, for people to be able to come in. And that means you have to disinfect everything, every single shit, you have to prepare the air conditionings, you have to, you know, it's, it's meaning we are ready, we have all ready if, if they allow us, but right now in the LA County, they're not allowing people to go back to the theater. And we cannot even perform outside, meaning, and like you're saying, uh, and thank God we we don't depend and meaning our ticket sales is not the biggest revenue for us because we're more social justice type of theater, meaning we do more political theater. So it's not necessarily uh, that the meaning our tickets are really inexpensive. You know, you can come and see a play in our theater for twenty dollars or fifteen dollars because it's a total different. It's more for working audience, so uh, we're not, you know, it's, we, we, we fare our, 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 our income from a different way. So what, that's what we're doing. We are rehearsing, meaning we've made a contract with SACS to see how many rehearsals we can have, uh, what type of equipment we need. You know, some of the directors are in New York, some of the directors are in LA, and that's, you know, and we can only use, actors in LA right now because directors want to have the same look and we need to give them the equipment that they need. By this means the green screen, whatever lighting, sound, computer that they need to do. It's complicated because we found out doing it on Facebook, sometimes it freezes, sometimes it comes down. We have, we have like three different platforms that we're working on to try to figure out the best platform that we can stream this. So man, it's a lot of work, yeah. a lot of work. But you can go to the LATC.org website and you can see all the programming, you know, if you, if you want to see what the programming is. It's very exciting. I personally, I don't think it's the answer to the world, mm -hmm. digital theater. Yeah. I think right now, it's just a need for us yeah. to engage with our audience to keep engaged with our audience is not necessarily, I don't think, as a solution for it. Uh, how in the future, meaning we, of course, we do these big festivals that you were talking about. Right now we're in the middle of preparing the global festival for 2021 in the fall. And we had a, you know, this, the way we do it, we have a global committee. By this means we have members of different parts of different countries who help us select the, the companies. In right now, we are going to do it a national festival next year because that's going to be impossible to do. Meaning, just trying to deal with visas and all of that. It's you know, it's 150 artists that we invite when we do that festival to come and stay with us for a month. Right. So that's a lot, and that's we're going to have to do it nationally next year. So in your space, because I've been down there, are you going to have to get a whole new air conditioning and ventilation system? Is that something that you have to do before you can open again? Like, what is physically? It's not a new a new air conditioning. It's different systems that they're saying that you can to put in every. We have, I think, we have seventeen instruments on the ceiling to be able to ventilate. We have to change something inside of it, which filter. I really don't know. The HIPAA filter, maybe you need that. But... Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's something like there is a, a, a program that you have to put inside the air conditioning system to be able to kill the virus and the, and the thing. It's, it's a special thing. I really don't know. At what point would you have to go? Like, I want to physically know when we can go to theater. Is that one of the steps that has to be done before, before we... the numbers have to go down? 
in, yeah, in I, I don't see the idea in order for them but at the county of, at least we have to follow the county thing and and then the state and one of the things that we find out is we have to be at least at one percent of infection rate and what do we have now like 18. <laughs> So, well, he, 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 Jose, this is a question for you. When do you think your theater will be back to normal? How long do you think it will take, really? Today, I was talking to some, meaning some people, but we we are making plans to come back in April next year. Okay. Wow. But that's when we're what, planning. What, what what will make that okay to open? Like, what are people waiting? The vaccine? I mean, what is the what are you? physically has to happen? What are the steps before? And is it gonna be big theaters like you? How are intimate theaters in LA? Are they gonna be able to go first? Or are those tight spaces not conducive to? I hope that we would be able to be back by around then in LA. And that's in a hundred seat theater in the Marilyn Monroe Theater in um, Strasbourg. Um, and, and I think that, that that amount of time means that there should be vaccines available. Like maybe I'm being too hopeful, but um, I I believe that. Yeah. But like, are those small theaters? How can they afford to do new ventilation system and and create new cleaning? And are, are everyone's on their own, right? Everybody is on their own in a way. I mean, you have to prepare. I Meaning, for us, we have to prepare just the financing in order to prepare the theater, understanding that, like right now what we're doing, we're doing research. Can I make one of my theaters into a digital studio <laughs> where I can actually produce for a 70 people in my 500 seat, I could only have one third, or in my 350 seat, I can only have 75 people inside the theater <laughs> And I will need to, what we're investigating, can I do a digital space where I can stream at the same time I have a live audience? And for those who decide not to come to the theater can see it live, or the people need to be, you know, you need to space people up, even when you come back next year. Because the people, people that make up, it's 30%, 50%. Yeah. Obviously we have no federal national plan so who makes up those numbers those guidelines is it actors equity who is who are we waiting for for the specific in, in, in la we're waiting for the county so the county is going to say as far as large theaters small theaters they're going to come up with the exact number i know we're waiting for the county guidelines and for the state guidelines really uh if the county said you can like right now even if you want to do performance outside you can't Really? Yeah. Yeah, because because it's entertainment. And if you do a performance yeah. guidelines outside, then they will have to allow concerts to happen outside. So for some reason, a lot of like film festivals, I know that we're talking about theater, they they were gonna release their movie this year, but then they decided not to do it because if they did it, they will have to have halfway uh, have halfway full theaters like only 50 percent off and they they're like i'm not gonna release my movie for with 20 seats that's right because you have to keep a space you said it right you have to keep like every two seats yeah. separation and people cannot sit together and they have to wear masks that's right is it, is it worth it like i mean april April, I was like, wow, but you, it, it sounds like a reasonable time to do all those alignments as well. But can't uh, there be a step before that? Like someplace like the John Ford, uh, the Noonan Theater is outside. So why couldn't they have 40% or 50 and do something where people are on stools separated just to see are people going to come to something? It's outside, you wear masks. I, I was surprised that all theaters just went like, you know, there's a couple on the East Coast that just started, but why couldn't someone, we're all creative people, come up with something or a one-person show? For us, for us, yes, because, meaning, I know that when we open, our audience is going to come back because we have a really young audience. 
which are the ones that are willing to go out. Or Arians are from 18 to 50. So I know or Arians is gonna come back. I'm not worried about that. I think they're gonna come just because they wanna be out. And if we give them the opportunity, they're gonna come. But we cannot, uh, I don't really want to, it's dangerous. I will feel really terrible if we open my theater and somebody dies, you know, because he gets infected. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and also we don't even know what the lawsuits can be. We have mm -hmm. no idea. Right, right, that's but true. Come into your theater and say, well, I got it right here and I'm suing you. Because why can't you say that if you go to Rouse and sue, why is it only going to theaters? Why, why are people going on airplanes? He was going for 15 hours. So why couldn't someone sue an airline? Why is it seems like theater is a, we can get on a plane for five hours and be sneezing on people, but we well, can't because, be in the theater for an they, hour and a half. Because they don't see theater as an essential necessity. You have to go around because you have to eat. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? You have to go in a plane because you really need to travel. You're not, you know, people are going on vacation right now, you, you know, but Culture is not. But if you yeah. want to go to the theater to be entertained, you know, and and I'm, and I'm, we, way to make I'm it. wooing you to come, and I'm selling come, you know, and I'm gonna give you a discount and the tickets, and we're safe and not, and we're not. It's a different thing. I'm attracting you to come. You're not just saying I'm going there. I'm selling you the idea for you to come into my space. Now, that's a good point, uh, Stan, and actually both of you. And I would love to know, Sandy, um, your opinion. I, mm -hmm. A SAG after actor, we get all this time, these messages. And Stan, you were an actor. I don't know if you still are, or if you're part of the SAG. We get all these messages that do not sign any agreement that, like, if you're going to work at this production, they might ask you to, to, to sign a release form, um, um, a liability. So if I get ill or injured, I mean, it's all about COVID-19, but if I get injured or sick or anything else, they, I, I won't make responsible the, 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 the production company. So Zach is like, do not fall for those. Please don't do that. You gotta keep safe because in the end of the, uh, at the end of the day, everybody is gonna cover up except the actors. We all gonna have to remove our masks at a certain point, even to put makeup on, mm -hmm. they use the same sponge. I have not, I totally told my agents, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna, I'm a voiceover talent as well. And I do these shows, I, as long as I can do it from home, I'll be willing to work. Yeah. I have to go outside unless, my character is really the only one or I'm very far away from another actor. I, I'm not sure I feel confident. I don't, I'm not sure I feel even like, I don't wanna even rehearse or anything. Imagine on stage, I know you can rehearse on Zoom and, and do all tons of things, but when it's time to shoot or to perform and I have to be close to someone, I'm actually, I'm, I'm also writing some short films and I'm turning them into COVID-19 adaptation if I want to work with them anytime soon or soon other, otherwise, I don't know. What's, what's, the, what's the rule in Canada? Well, I, I wanted to say to start, I mean, being an actor is already a health hazard. I mean, everything we have to put up with. I mean, the trials and tribulations, the ups and downs, the uncertainty, I think we've become I speak for myself and, and I guess a, a large circle of artists, you become comfortable with impermanence. Um, in a way, we're sort of built for this time. Um, I feel, you know, oddly enough, I, I feel really positive about things. I have a different uh, perspective being here in Canada since April, um, you know, being union here in, in, in my country as well. Um, they're just doing precautions. So no more of the whole, you know, sharing wardrobe or, you know, uh, you know, the food, you know, everyone lines up for food. It's there's no more of that. You bring your own brushes for makeup. Right. Um, going to auditions, you bring your own pen, you wear a mask, you take the mask after you slate or so 
I and you feel, are the only one there in the front of them. Yeah, and and I feel you know at least being here in Canada because we've our numbers have dropped and we've sort of worked together that people are returning to a um, a new kind of normal. Um, I think in time, the U.S. and L.A. will feel this. It's going to take a little bit more time. But I tell you, even right now, the gyms just opened. And it's like at first, I thought, I'm going to go with my mask. I have my bottle with my spray. It's like people are dipping their toe. And now, two weeks later, wow, it's busy. There's a lineup to get into the gym. So I think once the pendulum swings and we are resilient as actors, as artists, as producers, as writers, it's going to come back. Because you know what? You can see Picasso. You can see any kind of art you want on Google, but there's nothing like stepping into a museum and smelling and seeing the oil. It's the right, same with right. theater. And I wanted to make a point for Jose Valenzuela. I love what you said. I, I feel that the digital theater era at the moment is a Band-Aid solution. It's for now. But believe me, people are going to come back to wanting to feel um, the heart of the actor and, and to, to feel it. And I, I see it here because we're a little bit ahead you know, with our numbers. And now people are sitting on patios, but they're distanced, but they're respecting each other. Uh, people are seeing movies outside. And um, I think once the numbers start dropping and people start to dip their toe a little bit, it's going to be a new normal, but people are going to want to feel so much the heart of theater. You cannot live in a society with art, without art or theater. You know, you'll never, you'll never remember an era or a society based on their bank account, but you'll remember it based on, you know, the, the art of the time. So I feel really positive about it. Things are a little different here and we're following the rules a lot. I mean, even the auditions, like I said, it's, it's, but I'm seeing people dip the toes and theater is going to come back. I believe it. The gyms yeah. are, and Canada is showing those signs. It's just that the U S is behind. It's governed differently from our nation here, but it's going to, it's going to come back. Huh? It's not governed. <laughs> or no, lack of government. We're not supposed to talk about it. <laughs> I yeah, love, I love you guys. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's a difference right there. Yeah, well, it, well, okay, one of the one of the most important influences in the U.S. at the moment is the political situation. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry to have to say it, but yes, you no, know, I spend more time watching MSNBC than I do watching local news channels in Australia because it has an influence and an impact on the rest of the world. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, for good or for ill, what happens in the U.S. is important around the world, and totally. and the, the lack of the United States. Uh, in global um, places has really changed the world already. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, with China and Russia and all those places, I, I mean, the world is more frightening now than ever in my life. Yes. Just six more months. Six more months. <laughs> but I agree with so you because... It's 100 days. Is it 87 days or something like that now? Oh, we still, the scariest time is going to be November 4th till inauguration. Yeah. Dan, absolutely. Well, buckle your seatbelts. Yes. But the uh, North American countries, Canada and, and Mexico, which were surrounded by the U.S., it, it's really impacting the whole. Yeah, absolutely. The closer you are, the worse it is. You know, we're a long way away here, but but I certainly still feel it because a lot of our future is in America and 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 in South America as well. You know, we we Vang Hey, we when we added the Latino program three years ago when we were still at um, Stella Adler, um, it was a fantastic addition and right. it was madness, um, but it was still so much fun. Um, but it's got to a point where really I'm very comfortable with the Latino community and the amount of talent and the, the things that they've got to say and add to, to theater, you know, is fantastic. I'm very happy that you're talking about that. Let's switch a little bit the subject about, because um, all of you as well, Jose Luis with your, your Latino roots, but um, Stan doing your late, latest plays in, in Latinx versions uh, in March. I started that two years ago and uh, we got in a lot of trouble because Drudge Report and Breitbart uh, erroneously said that I was changing the Nazis in the plays to ICE agents. And then it became this worldwide controversy and I had to go on CNN 
to say, I'm literally doing the same play that Natalie Portman did the same script on Broadway. My only thing was everyone in the attic I'd cast with Latinx actors because my vision of it was, and Sandy saw it, was, it was the, amazing. Uh, people putting themselves in the shoes of those people back then. What are the similarities, what are not? Um, and at that point, people were saying, how dare you even touch upon the Holocaust and what's happening at the border? I, I don't think it was a bad idea to turn the ICE agents into Nazis. I think that's a perfect. Well, if you saw it, it was, it's like art. If you see that, you see that. But really, for me, it's always um, feeling how other people feel and learning from that situation. But it did, did bring up a lot of controversy when you take those two subjects and put them next to each other. That, that's actually very, I, I remember Sandy, she mentioned that you would. Yeah. Actually, why don't you repeat me, repeat what you said about you went to, to see his play. Oh gosh, I don't, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it, it's, it's amazing how relatable, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's people. It's, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter, ah. you know, but it, it's just, it's the, the story that's just relatable beyond your race. It, it's, I don't remember how eloquently I said this to you, Ben Hay, but um, I was really touched by it because you could have put anybody, could have been Latino, could have been Chinese, could have been anybody, uh, Stan, and we would have related because it's the story. At the end of the day, doesn't it show everybody that we're all the same? We're people, <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't really matter. And that's what you, you brought across, that we're just, we're people. We're existing for a minute. You know, we all have this thing. I'm so thing. interested in post-COVID, people will be able to relate to what Anne Frank and those people were in hiding for two years. Whereas yeah. before, I think people were like, you were where in the attic? How did you survive? And yes. I'm really waiting for that conversation um, to be had at our talkbacks because the best shows we've done is when we bring students who uh, most students in LA do not know, in California, don't know the Anne Frank story. And wow. then we have Holocaust survivors come speak and mm -hmm. it's just such a beautiful experience. So I'm looking forward to bringing that back. That would be amazing. And then Mark, I just remember, um, just so you know, Mark had previously showed up in Hollywood the previous year, four years ago, with with uh, Short and Sweet. And, uh, and I'm just like comparing how much the festival, the Short and Sweet has grown in Hollywood and how important it has become. And uh, I remember our dear friend Tanya Mordachi, she, she, she produced a, a play for the first edition of Sure and Sweet. And I think I, he, she approached to Mark like, why don't you do it in, in, in a Latino version? No, like, no, I said to her, we plan to do it. You did. So she came as the director. Yeah, she did. And she's like, where am I gonna get 13 plays? And that's when we met. So she, I used to be on a, um, I, I used to be the board member of a, of a Latino uh, no, no, was the was the sharp end of the stick, and and went into a new market basically and had to establish it really, which is a and, fantastic. And then thing. it's been amazing. It's been amazing ever since. I that's how I met her. And many of my very dear friends to this day came from Short and Sweet. Wow. You know, and the, then, the thing the thing that that brought it about in the first place was just that I noticed the first year that we did it that 50% or more of the people who live in Los Angeles identify as Spanish speaking and to me that that um, that Latino theater wasn't more engaged with the English speaking theater even though it was very um, healthy and growing by itself but really it's the same thing we're the same people you know that what what separates us is unimportant and what unites us is really the most important thing of who we are. So but the it interesting was obvious thing to do was no, no, no great genius. It was just bleeding obvious that we needed to do something where our short form version, which is very easy to mount and stage and get together, um, was a perfect fit really to do that. Well, what, what, what I found very interesting is people confuse when they hear the word Latino, immediately they have to think about illegal. And it's obviously yeah. ignorant people who doesn't know the story because five border um, states of this country, the US, be, used to belong to Mexico. So when you take the land, you take the people too, period. 
So, nice. so the, they didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. Indeed. They already grew up here and they already, so I, I, it happened to me too, I confessed me as a Mexico Mexican to me meeting Mexican Americans I never saw them as Mexicans at all they had a different accent they don't speak the same Spanish I do speak and Americans don't recognize them as Americans either because they don't speak the same language and so until I moved here and I married an American so I realized I realized that um, obviously, I'm, it's not the same kind of Latino. I was not born here. I grew. I did not grow up here, and, I, and it's just so different. So, going to theater and seeing all these stories, not all of them were in Spanish. They were in English, but they were performed by Latinos. Hmm. Latinos who grew up here, who have stories here, so who probably don't know any other country better than the U.S even yeah. though their parents or their ancestors are coming from other uh, Latin American countries or maybe Spain. So I, I just remember that very much. So I was like, very interesting, the, the way, the different stories that they brought. The, the, the story that I had to perform the very first edition, it had nothing to do with Latin America. It was all in English in my, co-partner, the other actor and I, he was totally American and the director was American and everything was in English. So it was, it had no relation. So that I loved about Sharon Sweet. And, and it was just like different, different stories that not necessarily had to do with immigration. It was also with a way of living. The mm -hmm. new, the new stories, you know, lawyers, everything. Yeah. They could Relati perform. Relationships and, act and culture and activities. And I, I the way that I think about the, the concept of Latino now is the same way I think about Europe. Like mm. when you think of Europe, you think of all these different um, countries with different textures and different personalities. And I think the same thing about the, the only thing you have in common is that you speak a language, you know, that Spanish is in common. And, and then what do you do with Brazil? Oh. Exactly, Portuguese, right? Yeah. You know, so, so I just think it's a fantastic the nuance and the subtlety and the different stories and the different experiences that are brought by the Latino people in LA is really fantastic. Yeah, I actually yeah. like that. And then the next year became already a whole section for Latino, and then this past third year, it's just been it's huge now with um, short films and dance. Yeah. And I see that also at the LATC, Jose Luis, because uh, you, even though you have the, the, the Latin Center as well, your section with your wife that you guys do, you also picked a lot of non-Latino stories and you are very, you are very, um, you, you have inclusion and you also produce all kinds of productions, not only for Latinos. And I really appreciate that. How do you pick the stories that you that perform in, in the LATC? Well, it, it's, it's, you know, because we started at the LATC in 1985 when it was founded. And it was, and it was a, uh, a regional theater. It was a large theater at the time. It was I not- It was a bank. It wasn't a bank, that place, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. In 1918, and then right. in the 1950s uh, closed down. And then, it, and then when in 1980s, it was transformed into the theater center by Bill Bushnell and Diane White and Alan Mandel, these three people. And I got hired as a director, just to come and direct, and I was directing, and then I created a Latino company. But at the theater, it was all kinds of different, I mean, it was just a regular Lord Theater. So when I took it over, when we took it over as a company, we still kind of same, same thing. And we tried to say that we do uh, theater for people of color. So we do Asian and African-American, Irish, Jewish, 
you know, we try to be as diverse as we can. Inclusion and diversity, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but, but, you know, but the LATC that is only a building, doesn't exist anything else. It's mm -hmm. only a building who belongs to the city, who gave us to us for 25 years, and they didn't allow us to change the name. But it's, it's only the building, the nonprofit as a Latino theater company. Gotcha. So, we, you know what I mean? We run the entire thing. But because people felt the LATC already had a name, the city didn't want to lose it. So they, if not, we would have changed it to be the Latino Theater Center. I oh, would, really? Okay. Yeah, I would have taken away the LATC. Got it. So I actually don't use Los Angeles Theater Center anymore. I just use LATC, who can be an acronym for Latino Theater Center. Ah. Oh. You know? Yeah. But it, because we're Latinos, doesn't mean we're not global. Right. Meaning we can produce everything else. Mm -hmm. We don't have to produce just Latino, meaning nobody question the Marte Perforum because produce non-white plays. Right. I mean, so we should be able to produce whatever we want. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, 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 it's the, the only reason is because, look at, LA, I love LA. <laughs> you know, I'm from Mexico. I'm from Mexico. I'm a Mexican. And, uh, but, you know, but my Mary, I mean, my wife and my children, I meaning my, I'm going to have a grandchild and my grandbaby is going to be six generations in the United States. Wow. Meaning, so I live in that world with, with all the people that's around me, they're being here from the turn of the 20th century or from the 19th century. The people that I know, they were Mexicans here. Right. They were, you know what I mean? They didn't. So it's a very different story. And, and because I work on the mainstream per se, you know, like, I mean, I had, I had cancel. I was directing a play in Cincinnati and Milwaukee at the Guthrie during that when so they got canceled because of the COVID, right. you know? And uh, so I had to, my audience is much more uh, English speaker than, than Spanish speaker speaking. So, you know, it's, it's so we have to kind of do that. It's, it's, the, it's the new, the new, the new young audience in, in the United States, which is the people who, Either were brought here as child, as children, or they were born here. Mm. You know, so it's crazy. But so your your wife is also into production and writer, and your daughter is an actress. So you're surrounded by also performers. Or yeah, my daughter is an actress. My son is an actor. My wife is an actress and a and a writer. Yeah, you know, like and. I'm just a director, that's all I do. But yeah, so, my, my entire family is <laughs> all in the theater. Yes, yes, yes. And the company that I created 20, 35 years ago, they're the same actors that we've been together for 35 years. You use a lot of actors. I've seen that you repeat actors. Fantastic, by the way. Yeah, they're a company because we train together as actors. We'll train together as actors to perform. So they're, they're the same group of people that have been together for 35 years. So I wanna, I wanna ask, it, it's amazing actually. I'm, yeah. Like I, lo I remember I went to see a play with you that lasted six hours, six hours and lunch was included for <sighs> dinner. It's and I was like, I have no idea how am I gonna make it, but it was, it was amazing. <laughs> And I did, and it was fantastic. And I really needed to go back to see what happened. And you broke it into three parts. So we had breaks, one break, and then the second break was dinner. And then the third break was just like stretching your legs or something. But it was just like a Broadway production in LA. A Mexican trilogy. They just bought it. Uh, Imagine, Imagine Entertainment just bought it. 
to make it into a television series. It, it's oh. amazing. Julio Macias is the one that brought me. I love Julio. Yes, he was your friend. Yes. And now he's a, he's a TV series star. He's yeah. a star. So um, Stan in Mark, I have a question for you guys. How did you, I mean, Mark, you were a producer. Well, you are a producer, director, but you were a journalist. And then also in the advertisement and then moved to this, I know. What tricked you to move you to do this, to move into, to do the switch? And well, I, I, I was interested and did theater while I was masquerading as a journalist and a newspaper yeah. editor. So, but, but the trick is always, how do you make a living? You know, how do you eat? So, so that's the thing that we all need to decide. You know, actors can be lucky and do that very easily. But if you're a writer, I mean, it's very hard to make a living as a playwright. I, Stan, I don't know what percentage of your income comes from being a playwright. Well, he's in TV. That's what I want to know. I mean, he's... Well, I started as an actor and I, I was masquerading as a TV sitcom writer. Uh -huh, and yeah. uh, my love has always been theater. And then luckily through television, I got to direct my first play at the Celebration Theater. And tell, that tell, tell the name, repeat it the name, repeat it again, everything. What? The, your first play and... I was Gemini, Albert and Eduardo. And, um, and then I was in New York uh, having some martinis, which I'd love one right now. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, which I will when we end this. And um, uh, uh, Larry Hirshhorn, a big Broadway producer said, stop directing other people's plays. You're a writer, right? And I didn't think uh, anyone would care about what I had to write about my life. And then I came up with this idea called Meet and Greet about four actresses of a certain age. And what I make actors do is sit in a room uh, with each other before they audition for me. And that's what the play is about. And mm -hmm. that got me into writing theater. And I just, I was hooked again to, with theater. And, and I really wanted to kind of change the landscape of intimate theater in LA. It seemed to me it was different than New York and London where it was, you know, in the bigger theaters like the Mark Taper or the Geffen, they were big TV stars, but they didn't go to small intimate theaters and I had the connections of working with TV actors and I brought them into you know like the complex Hollywood 50 seat theaters yeah. and that's where I've just been enjoying it so much. Well guys it's been amazing to hear you and I love that we are all like <laughs> in, in our like in our living room like if we, we were in person here but <laughs> I started this late because the stupid Facebook won't work. Um, connect us, we, we were in a big delay. But I really, really appreciate that you took the time to be with us, to be with me, with Actor Slash, and talk about yourselves, about your projects. Um, so we have to wrap it up. And Jose Luis also, I took Stan out of his project that he was reading rehearsing and Jose Luis has to go to another one but I and, and Mark has to do pancakes for his daughter <laughs> something but I love for you before we go to tell us where can you be found uh any your website social media it's on all actors slash you're tagged in every single place but I'll do it again because now we're on YouTube which I think I'm going to start doing from now on <laughs> hey, Jose Luis, I'm going to take your word and probably if I can hang out with your production team to learn more about streaming with OBS. Um, please tell us where um, the LATC.org, that's where you can find Jose Luis, but you want to say on your own words, any of um, your social media, anything? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook, Jose Luis Valenzuela, I think it's, it's not hard. It's the only thing I do, Facebook, but you can find me on the website. It's, it's my, my, my cell number and my, and my email is into the LATC website. You can email me or you know, get in touch with me. That's how I tracked them down. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> it's really wonderful to, to really, I mean, I, we met, I saw your performance uh, in FEFU. 
in, uh, in, in, in it's really great, Mark, uh, meeting you. I don't know if we ever met in person. We probably we almost, we almost did. Tanya was trying to set something up, but I'm in and out of the country. So as soon as they let me back in, I'll come see you. Anyway. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. This has been a really, really pleasure. That will Thank be a Thank you. Yes. Wait, wait, Stan, where can they find you? Uh, ZimmermanStan.com, or probably sitting right here for my third day in a row. <laughs> Of, of 10 hour Zoom experiences. <laughs> All right, where can you be found? Oh, Me? Sweet. Mar Let's go with Mark real quick. Oh, Mark, sorry. Uh, I'm shortandsweet.org um, or, or just search Short and Sweet on Facebook or Google. It's hard, hard not to find us. Excellent. Well, you, so many countries, like it's Short and Sweet Australia, Short and Sweet la 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 la, but yeah. Uh, Sandy? Uh, very simple. I, I love Instagram. Sandy underscore underscore Duarte, I believe. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, IMDb. <laughs> just, uh, but, I, but I love Instagram. I feel like it's just immediate and it's, it's you know, it's to the point. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you, guys. Thank you. And you can find me as vanhetapia.com or actorslash.com and social media, same names, either way. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, We have to meet Mark. Mwah, thank you so much. This was much. fun. Thank you, guys. Bye. You have my number. Take care, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Mark, you should stay. We should continue the chit-chat. No, he left. Sandy, don't go. Wait. Huh? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> yeah, but let me, I don't know how to end the... Um, I don't know how to end the... The stop the live streaming. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Now it's the two of us. Uh, <laughs> with Sandy.